Hi there, thanks for joining me today. My name is Linda Carlson. I'm a professor in the Department of Oncology at the University of Calgary in Canada, and I'm currently the president of the Society for Integrative Oncology. Thank you so much for inviting me to your conference. I'm very sorry that I was not able to come in person or to present live, but I hope that this recording will share with you some of the information that we're hoping um, to get across to you with uh, regards to integrative oncology and the Society for Integrative Oncology. So the title of my talk today is Global Development Strategy of Integrative Oncology. And again, I thank you very much for the invitation. There we go. Um, so I'm representing the Society for Integrative Oncology and our mission is to advance evidence-based, comprehensive, integrative healthcare to improve the lives of people affected by cancer worldwide. So let's take a step back and begin by defining integrative oncology. So this is an official definition um, from SIO that we came to by consulting experts from around the world. And so integrative oncology is a patient-centered, evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and lifestyle modifications alongside conventional cancer treatments. Integrative oncology aims to optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across the cancer care continuum. So from the time of prevention to diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, end of life, and to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during, and beyond cancer treatment. So that definition has been published in 2017, um, and you can find it at the JNCI monographs in that reference at the bottom of the screen. So let's take a step back and look at some terminology. So it's important to make a distinction between complementary and alternative treatments. So complementary therapies are those interventions, products, and procedures that aren't traditionally part of conventional medicine, but are typically used alongside conventional cancer treatments. So that's the integrative part. So when we talk about integrative oncology, we're talking about using therapies in complement with conventional care. On the other hand, alternative therapies are interventions that are chosen instead of conventional cancer care. So when a person says, no, I don't want surgery or chemo, I'm going to go off to a clinic somewhere else and try these other therapies. They're often unproven. They're not always evidence-based and can be expensive for people to pay out of pocket and often require travel. Um, and so they're not part of integrative oncology care. So we don't advocate for those kind of alternative therapies. And in fact, research shows that people who choose alternative treatments instead of conventional care may have worse outcomes but people who choose complementary therapies alongside conventional care may have better outcomes. So let's look at some of the data. Studies from across the world, uh, here one with 18 countries, shows about half of people diagnosed with cancers have used complementary therapies since their diagnosis. We've done some work in Canada and shown a similar number, about 48%. So in our survey of patients at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, where I work, uh, we had about 47% of patients indicating they use these therapies. And uh, people who were more likely to use them were women, younger people, who were more highly educated and had been living with cancer for a longer time. So longer time since diagnosis. Of those using complementary therapies, the most commonly used were natural health products. And so almost three quarters of people using therapies were using some type of natural health products like vitamins, herbs, uh, that kind of thing. The reasons they told us they were using complementary therapies, the largest reason was to improve their quality of life, to enhance or improve their immune system, to give them feelings of hope and that they were taking control of their illness and a smaller proportion were hoping they would help to cure their cancer. Now, when we look at healthcare providers and their communication around complementary therapies and their knowledge about these therapies, unfortunately, it's not that great. 
So a survey conducted by some of our SIO members, uh, a national survey of US oncologist knowledge, attitudes and practice patterns, specifically regarding herb and supplement use, found that less than half, around 40% of oncologists discussed herbs and supplement use with their patients. So that means that more than half weren't even bringing it up. And only one in three of these oncologists felt comfortable advising their patients, um, giving recommendations about what's a good thing to use and what should be avoided. Similarly, in the survey we did here in Canada, more than 80% of the providers said they had limited knowledge of complementary therapies, period, also the evidence for their use, um, and they didn't feel comfortable advising patients. So when we put those together, what we have is half of patients using some kind of complementary or integrated medicine. They have many misconceptions around the benefits. They're often getting advice from family and friends and not the healthcare providers but they want to use these therapies to regain control of their cancer and implement strategies that may help them cope and improve their outcomes. So alongside that, we have this lack of communication among healthcare providers with their patients, you know, about what's evidence-based, what they should be using, what they should avoid. So they have a lack of knowledge on the evidence for these various therapies. But of course, providers want to provide evidence-based recommendations and they want to avoid harm, especially. So obviously that leads us to the conclusion that we need to provide education for both patients and healthcare providers and training in integrative oncology to healthcare providers. And we need to improve access to those complementary therapies that evidence shows could be beneficial for patients. So there's lots of work to do in this area. Now, if we look at the most common risk factors, modifiable risk factors for cancer, these are also falling under the domain of integrative oncology therapies. So tobacco use, you can see the yellow line here. Oops. There we go. Um, the biggest risk factor that's modifiable is tobacco use. So smoking cessation is obviously important. There's my pointer, hopefully you can see it. Um, and that's a risk factor for many types of cancer. Then we have obesity and sedentary behaviors. And those are risk factors. That's a risk factor as well for a number of different types of cancers. Uh, we have things like pathogens in the environment, viruses that can be uh, avoided perhaps. And then things like uh, dietary habits and nutrition. Um, we know that poor diet is a risk factor, especially for colon cancer and breast cancer risk. There's things like sun exposure we've known about for a long time. Um, and stress is coming up as a potential risk factor for a number of different types of cancer. And even sleep disturbances, having poor sleep increases risk for breast cancer at least, um, and likely other types, but we just know a lot more about breast cancer risk. And then different environmental toxin, toxins that can also be um, avoided through uh, the way we set up our households and, and live our lives. So if we look at the area of integrative oncology, lifestyle modifications that target some of those behaviors are a big part of the interventions that are included there. Um, the other areas that are included in integrative oncology are mind and body practices. So those are things like meditation and yoga and also the use of natural products. So a lot of the herbal supplements you would see within traditional Chinese medicine would fall under that as well. Now that's combined, or I guess the use of the different interventions is guided by patients' values and preferences and their rights to have autonomy around the types of treatment they want, combined with our knowledge from the research evidence around what types of therapies are helpful, uh, what therapies do we not have enough research about to make decisions, which ones are potentially harmful, and also combined with clinical experience. So clinicians have many decades of experience trying different therapies with patients and seeing what seems to be beneficial. So we combine all these things together to choose an individualized integrative oncology program for patients as they're going through cancer care. So specifically within those categories of complementary therapies, I mentioned lifestyle modifications. So here, mostly we're talking about exercise and physical activity overall. 
uh, diet, nutrition. So that's a huge part of improving lifestyle, getting good sleep, good sleep hygiene, good sleep habits, and managing stress. So these are what we would call foundations of wellness. And there's many different stress management techniques, including mind-body therapies, but also other approaches like cognitive behavior therapy um, and, and many different things people can do to help manage stress. So when we think of the mind-body therapies, the main ones there with a strong evidence for uh, support for their efficacy are things like mindfulness meditation, uh, yoga practice, so generally forms of hatha yoga, um, practices from traditional Chinese medicine like acupuncture as a growing evidence base for its efficacy for things like managing pain. And then interventions like based on Tai Chi and Qigong are becoming increasingly popular with research from around the world showing potential benefits for people with cancer. Then we have the natural health products. So here are many different vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, uh, botanicals, herbal supplements, um, even specific diets uh, people have a lot of interest in. So those are the main areas that fall under the umbrella of integrative oncology. And so I'll turn now to talking a bit more about SIO. So we're a fairly young organization, but celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. So founded in 2003, we're the premier multidisciplinary professional organization for integrative oncology. We have over 500 members, and I think nearing 600 at this point um, from around the world. We are largely based in North America, but really making an effort over the last few years to expand that globally. And it's really important that we are multidisciplinary. So unlike some other professional organizations, you really will find people from all different backgrounds. There's definitely uh, physicians, oncologists, people with specialized training in integrative oncology. But I personally am a clinical psychologist. There's nurses, there's practitioners of the different complementary therapies. So we have nutritionists, exercise people, um, lots of yoga therapists, uh, people who provide acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, naturopathic doctors. It's really a broad range. We also have involvement from a lot of patient advocates. Um, and, and yeah, sort of also even um, bench scientists. So the mission is to advance evidence-based, comprehensive integrative healthcare to improve the lives of people affected by cancer. And we have a strong commitment to rigorous scientific research and evidence-informed practice. So I'm currently president and I'm halfway through a two-year term. So I'll be president for another year or so. And please check out our website, integrativeonc.org. It's got a lot of information about the society there. So as I said, our mission is to advance evidence-based comprehensive integrative healthcare to improve the lives of people affected by cancer. Our values are that we are evidence-based in all our recommendations. As I mentioned, interdisciplinarity. Um, so really having people from all different backgrounds. It's very patient-centered. Um, and our patient advocate uh, committee is actually very large and very active. We're working towards international and national outreach. And uh, over the past three years, we've really been focusing on health equity as well. So trying to make sure that integrative oncology information and interventions are available to people who even come from backgrounds where they're uh, less likely to have access to cancer care, um, people who may be underserved, lower SES socioeconomic status, different cultural backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, all that, uh, you know, areas that traditionally haven't had as much as good access to, to conventional cancer care or integrative therapies. And our long-term goal is to make integrative oncology part of standard care. You know, so there's often people say that you, we want to eliminate that distinction between conventional and complementary and just have good care or standard care that includes both elements. So kind of our flagship uh, event here is our uh, annual conferences. And so we have one coming up in uh, Arizona near Phoenix, October 20th to 22nd. Um, I know it's a long way to travel and short time frame, So we do have virtual options. Um, the, the virtual option allows you to access some of the keynote presentations, not all of the workshops or the concurrent sessions, but a good chunk of the highlights you'll get with a virtual um, joining through the virtual conference virtual registration. 
And then in 2023, I'm really excited because we're going to be um, in my backyard, which is Banff, Canada, the beautiful location in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And that's our 20th anniversary. So we'll have quite a celebration there. And we'll also have a virtual option uh, for people who aren't able to travel where you can access the keynote, uh, different uh, workshops and sessions that are happening. So there's a number of benefits for joining SIO, um, for example, participation. So we have lots of special interest groups, committees and task forces, really allows you to network and get to know people and get involved in projects, um, elevate your knowledge. So we have member access to a number of different databases, research databases for natural medicines and integrative oncology. We also have partnerships with a couple of different journals where you can get uh, access to journals and discounted subscriptions. And we have lots of educational events too. So there's the annual conference, but we also have uh, webinars for members. We have surveys and a monthly newsletter that goes out. We have a podcast called Integrative Oncology Talk. And we have access to research grant funding um, for international members, even through the Gateway for Cancer Research Partnership. Another one of our flagship programs is clinical practice guidelines. And so we've been working on five, we have a five year uh, program of clinical practice guidelines that are uh, in partnership with the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And this is important because ASCO is the largest body of oncologists in the world. And so they will be promoting these guidelines through their flagship journal. And the first guideline, an integrative approach to cancer-related pain management, is, is scheduled to come out within uh, a week or two from now, and it should come out with a big splash. Um, the co-chair on that, one of them, is Jun Mao, who you know and will be speaking with uh, shortly, if you haven't already. So that's really exciting to see that guideline coming out. And our hope is that clinicians will take these guidelines um, that recommend, for example, acupuncture should be used to treat cancer-related pain. Um, and really begin to incorporate these therapies into standard care. The second guideline is on screening assessment and management of fatigue in adult cancer survivors. And again, we have some SIO members on that panel um, advising on integrative approaches to fatigue. The third guideline is integrative oncology care of anxiety and depression symptoms. And so I'm co-chair of that along with uh, Julia Rowland, who is the former chair of cancer survivorship, the Office of Cancer Survivorship through the National Institutes of Health in the US. So we're excited that one's well on its way and should be out within the year. And then we've got uh, guidelines four and five that we haven't started working on yet. So that'll be uh, exciting to move those along soon too. So in terms of how we're organized, um, in our organizational structure at the top, we have a board of trustees, that's about 25 members um, who have been involved in different committees and task force and become elected to the board. Within the board, we have the executive committee. Uh, so that's a smaller group of people uh, who meet on a more regular basis, and I'll tell you who we are in a moment. And then below that, we have all the different committees, task forces, and special interest groups that uh, move forward a lot of the, the specific projects that we work on. So here's our executive committee. So as I said, I'm the president. Santos Rao is our president-elect. He'll be taking over um, after the 2023 conference. Joni McLeod is a patient advocate and our wonderful secretary who helps us get things done. Ting Bao is our immediate past president from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, she works with Jun Mao, who is one of our past presidents from a few years back. Anna Maria Lopez is our treasurer from uh, Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. And Channing Pal Paller is our VP Advancements from Johns Hopkins. And we do have another executive committee member who we haven't added here yet, that's Eugene Ahn, and he is our VP of Communications. So in terms of the different committees and whatnot, um, we have uh, communications. And so uh, any of our members can ask to join committees and communications oversees a lot of our different projects. We have lots of communication outlets. So we have our website, we have our webinars, um, we have social media on about five different channels. And we also have our podcast, Integrative Oncology Talk, um, and different promotional things going out. So that's overseen by communications. Uh, each year we have a conference planning committee that develops our flagship conference. We have a membership development committee that's working actually on getting members more globally. Uh, practice guidelines, as I mentioned, those different guidelines that we're working on with ASCO. I have an education committee, our research committee is very active and they often publish papers on different relevant research topics. 
clinical practice committee uh, works on how to take the research into practice. We have a large patient advocate group um, that has representatives on all the different committees. And also we have a new emphasis on health equity, inclusion and belonging, as I mentioned. Our task forces are advancement and global. So I'll tell you a bit more about our uh, work in the global area. Advancement is about sort of expanding um, the size of our society and our reach and our potential to fund different projects. And then any members can join our special interest groups. And so right now we have acupuncture, nursing, pediatrics, program management and development, and a really large special interest group, an active one in uh, the area of yoga therapy. And members can also um, propose special interest groups um, if they'd like to set one up too. So if we look at our membership by regions around the country, um, as I said, this is 2021 and uh, the bulk of our members are in North America. Um, so the green countries have the most members. So we have quite a few in Australia as well. And then you can see some of the Euro European countries like Italy and Germany and purple, we have a good chunk of members and then fewer members um, as we go to South America and Africa and Asia. You can see in China there, it looks like we're around the, I don't know, five to 10 members. So we'd really like to expand our membership um, from your country. And so really hoping that uh, some of you will consider joining. We have this international ambassador program. Um, and so the idea here is that we'll have these sort of regional and national ambassadors who will help to bridge what's happening with SIO and what's happening um, locally within your own countries uh, through integrative oncology. So we have an ambassador in Europe and the Middle East, that's Aran Van Eyre. He's been very active and co-leads our global task force along with Jun Mao. We have national ambassadors in Australia, Brazil and the UK. And we're looking for future regional ambassadors from Central South America, from Africa and from East Asia. So again, we are looking for more involvement um, from your region. And if there's anyone there who's interested in becoming an ambassador, please do reach out uh, to June or myself. And also we're looking for ambassadors from uh, South Asia and the South Pacific. So this timeline just shows you a little bit of some of our global activities over the years we've been around. Um, and so we were founded in 2003, as I said. In 2008, actually, we reached out and had a uh, joint conference in Shanghai. And I think Lorenzo Cohen, who some of you may know, was one of our uh, early presidents, organized that, which was a great success. But then there wasn't a lot that happened in the intervening years until we uh, founded our global task force in 2019 and then began the in International Ambassador Program. Um, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we quickly converted our conference to a virtual platform and we were able to give uh, give out 40 international scholarships for people to join our conference virtually um, and so this is sort of the breakdown of where those went um, you know so a big chunk of it was uh, white people but also we had quite a few African um, and people from Africa and black people as well as some Spanish speaking people here's an Asian group here um, and also Middle Eastern and American Indian, a few people. So really trying to expand our reach and our diversity. In 2021, um, we had a great international program track at our conference. And we also have that for 2022. So all the events, the sort of large, um, there's a, like a global workshop and a discussion group around education and integrative oncology globally. Those are all available virtually. If you register for the virtual conference, um, you'll have access to those things. So as I said, we're looking forward to expanding our reach globally um, over the next few years. So just to summarize what I've covered, um, we know that integrative oncology is a growing field that's increasingly ingrained in oncology care worldwide and we're aiming to make it standard of care. We aim to promote integrative oncology worldwide, expand more globally with our regional ambassador program. And as I said, we invite everyone to join and attend our conferences. Uh, we'd love for you to reach out to us. So there's our website for all sorts of information about the society um, and a, a general uh, email address there, info at integrativeonc.org. You can send your questions or queries there and we'll be able to hopefully respond to you. So thank you once again for inviting me. I hope you found this information useful and interesting. Um, and I apologize, I'm not able to be there live, but I'm sure you'll have a wonderful conference and I look forward to engaging with you all in the future. Thanks very much.